Awesome. So I am, uh, thanks for everybody joining. Um, I'm like super stoked about this. The IAPA show was amazing. <clears throat> I'm going to start right on time. I want to be really respectful of everybody's time, and we have a shit ton to cover. Um, oh, my pleasure, Antoine. Um, it's uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was a big show for VR this year at IAPA, and um, I know not everybody got a chance to do it. And even the people that got that, like I know I've worked that show 20 times plus. That was my 27th anniversary IAPA, um, though I did skip a few years here and there, but. Um, and uh, and I know how hard it is, especially when you're working, like to get to everything. Like I was really struggling, and I was running around like crazy, and um, and it was uh, it was hard to catch everything. Yeah, Ronan, I'll be sending out a um, a replay to everybody um, that registered, and I'll be posting it online too for the people that didn't quite catch it. Because um, usually you get about 106 out of 160 some odd people registered, half will actually show up, and the other half will try to see the replay. So. Awesome. So um, have you found your site yet, Ronan? I've been thinking about you. You know, Anvio lost their site in, um, in London. So, the wide, they're, so they're competing with you looking for real estate right now, by the way. So, all right, cool. So I'm going to see if I can throw this up and, uh, and get started. So how do I do this? Sharing options, presentation materials. Here we go. Yes, I do. So... Um, So, uh, yeah, this is the webinar for busy people. Um, so we're going to cover uh, a few things. One is um, is we're going to go through a quick overview of the state of the VR market. A lot has changed since my last webinar and thought um, might be worth doing a kind of a high-level overview of what's going on. I want to touch on some emerging standards that are happening um, around um, some of the tracking systems. And I know Kevin Williams and Charlie Fink have been kind of pushing, um, you know, saying we need some standards and they should create them. And I'm a believer of letting things like that emerge. And we're starting to see that emerge. So I'll try to touch on that, um, but really briefly. Um, and then we're going to talk about why VR is here to stay um, and why you need more than one VR attraction, especially if you're in the family entertainment center business. And then we're going to get into the best of the best. So I'm just going to crank right in really fast. Um, so, a couple of things. I like to use Google Trends to see what's happening in the zeitgeist of um, of, uh, of people's mindset. And this is the a lot of people are talking about augmented reality now, and you know, and virtual realities jump the shark, or it's you know past the hype cycle, and and now augmented reality is everything. But when you look at Google Trends of who's searching for con for the two subjects of VR and AR, um, while VR exploded and has come back down a bit. Um, you can see AR is barely a blip. Um, and then um, this is the other thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about escape rooms. Uh, I've been really excited about virtual escape rooms lately. And, um, and this shows the popularity of the search term escape rooms versus virtual reality. And you can see escape rooms are still not only popular, but even still growing a bit. Um, if you look at the trend, this is over, I think this is a five-year time, time frame. So, um, and I think that combination of VR and escape rooms is uh, is really something that we need to keep an eye on, and I'll be talking about um, not only today but in, into the near future. Uh, just a little bit of overview of the consumer market. Um, a lot of people had a lot of hype around Oculus Go, and people thought that was going to be like the big consumer thing um, because it was cheap. It was 200 bucks, and Facebook was behind it. And you can see here, this is the Oculus Go sales ranking from Amazon from May to July. Uh, it launched the end of May, and you could just see it plummeted um, to next to nothing. Um, now, some of that is it was a crap product. It didn't. There was no. There was no real content for it. People say there was, but the problem is it's still not solving a problem for the consumer market. Um, there are some new headsets coming out next year, um, and um, and uh, later this year, actually, you'll see. Um, HTC shipping the Vive Focus, which is an all-in-one headset with inside-out tracking, six degrees of freedom. Vi uh, Oculus will ship their version of that in April next year, hopefully, uh, called the Quest. Um, and that's going to change things a bit. Like That's going to be the first product that actually might have a chance of getting some traction, but still lots of challenges regarding um, content, problem solving, uh, discomfort, you need a lot of space. Like all those headwinds are still there for VR, which I've written a lot about. And 
um, we'll continue to talk about as long as it's relevant. James, what do you mean by XR insights? X is uh, the the term XR is kind of something that people throw around now, especially in the via, in the in the R community. I guess it's called to cover everything: AR, X, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, James, I know what you're talking about as far as XR goes. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, I got one of the questions I got a lot at this show um, from operators was, why do I need more than one VR gamer attraction? And it was a really, really interesting question to me um, because I think what a lot of people have done is they've bought, especially in the FEC community, they've bought Hologate, and now they're like, okay, I'm done. I checked that box. I've got a VR. <laughs> and, um, and so my answer to that was, um, how many arcade games do you have in your arcade? And the particular person that um, runs a, a large family entertainment center in Asia, she said over 200. And I was like, well, why don't you just have one? And she kind of looked at me. And there was a whole team. It was a big company, and they had a team there. And they all kind of looked at me and smiled a little bit. Um, and she's like, well, the, you know, they're all different. And I'm like, well, are they really? You've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine do the same thing you've got a whole bunch of you know money eaters um you know big bass wheel and ticket redemption games and um and uh and then you know these are the big earning arcade games on the floor right now you've got transformers you've got walking dead you've got halo you've got house of the dead most entertainment centers have all of these games and if you play them all you'll notice um immediately that they're all the same game. The game mechanic, the core loop are exactly the same. Um, story's a little bit different. Walking Dead especially has a great storyline. Um, but, but, you know, and Halo's got some different weapon choices. But in essence, it's the same game. And so when you line up, um, I'll use the four-player arcade trust-based systems that, you know, Hologate inspired, like Minority Media's Chaos Jump and, and Play VR um, uh, and Exit Reality um, system like Revolver and 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 World of Tanks VR and even Innowise's Quest Arena, you know, the games are all different. Some are better than others, but, you know, they're all somewhat different games, and they're, they're certainly no less different than these products are. Um, and so I think that, um, I think having, you know, multiple VR attractions is something that you're going to start to see operators get their heads around, and this is something I'll be pounding the drum on. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would say, these pinball machines are all the same too, but if you got a pinball enthusiast in there, they would freaking punch you in the face uh, because you know the nuance of the table designs and the and the game mechanics within the pinballs are very different, and which is why pinball is so you know is so popular, and people will have a particular game that they absolutely love. Um, and so you know the other thing I want to touch on really quick as far as why I think VR is really not only here to say, but you're going to start to see it you know, implemented in, I think within five years, 10 years at the outside, um, you know, you're going to see all arcade games be VR. And so st bear with me. So in the very beginning, you know, all these arcade games, when I was a kid and I used to go to the neighborhood arcade, were all CRTs, right? Cathode ray tubes for those of you youngsters out there. Um, and then what happened was in the early 90s, right around the time I was starting to build laser tag arenas, laser storm, the game, the arcade games went to these big rear 50 inch rear projection screens, and that was about deeper immersion. Um, and so these games got really, real immersion, really immersive. And in fact, in 1996, I went to the Asian Amusement Expo, I, it was either in Hong, I think it was in Singapore actually, and gave a keynote there about virtual reality and immersive entertainment. And my argument was that games like Prop Cycle and Alpine Racer. Um, which you see Alpine Racer here, were actually a version of virtual reality, right? It was really, really immersive. Um, and it was because of those big screens and you're up close and you have different you know, methods of, of engagement with the game. And then what happened is we went to a period of efficiency where those games went to LCD panels. And that was about lower cost, lighter weight, easier to service, longer lasting, brighter screens, lower maintenance. It was just a more efficient version of that immersion. Well, now what we're seeing is we're going to VR, and that's about deeper immersion again. So we went from CRT to, to big screen, projection screen, which is about deeper immersion. Then we went to LCD, which is about efficiency. And now we're going back through the cycle of deeper immersion. And you're hearing immersive entertainment being thrown around like crazy. Um, and VR is the ultimate way of being immersed. So, um, so anyway, I think that when, when people think about VR potentially as a, I need a VR, 
I am imagining they probably thought the same thing about an arcade game would have had a big screen. And as Kevin Backus said, they don't they didn't call them big screen arcade games. They were just arcade games. And I think we're gonna see the same thing with VR and it's here to say and and my you know, I'm encouraging VR operators that you know, one attraction is not enough, especially if it's a good attraction, because people are going to use that as a gateway drug to doing more and more VR. They're going to want more variety. So um, I also wanted to talk, I want to talk about, um, um, there was something I had, I'm going to go back and look at my, um, and look at my summary, because I actually, I threw these slides together literally on the plane this morning, because the show just ended Friday, literally, and I haven't had time to like collate everything, but oh, emerging standards. I want to talk a little bit about standards. Um, so what's happening in the in the free roam space, especially, is there are two trends um, that we're seeing things solidify. And I saw this at the show: um, HTC Vive and Lighthouse Pro and Lighthouse 2.0, which is now shipping, um, and you're seeing solution providers start to implement uh, Vive Pro and Lighthouse 2 is capable of doing, um, it looks like up to six players in about a thousand square feet. And so um, is, uh, I actually did a demo uh, on, on before the show started when it was on setup day on Monday, a company called Platforma VR. And they, um, they were out in that innovation station or exploration station tents where there was a lot of new, and a lot of new exhibitors um, were stuck this year. And they had a four player, um, PV player versus player backpack based system running on um, on Lighthouse, and so did VR Studios with their um, uh, their system, which I'll talk about in a little more detail in a second. And so we're starting to see like backpack based systems running on Lighthouse. Uh, Arizona Sunshine is another company that's selling you know a four player backpack system with Lighthouse for fifty grand or something like that, all in. So I think you're going to start to see these big high end OptiTrack systems. Um, that are running in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you can start to see those be really challenged. And the companies that are deploying those, you know, are going to have to find ways of really differentiating themselves. And we'll talk about one of the ones that I think is doing that. Um, and um, and my guess is they're going to be moving to other to tracking technologies to try to bring the cost of those systems down. It wasn't a year ago when a zero latency system was six hundred thousand dollars. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're seeing the prices of all those systems really come down. The second thing is, um, is these kind of, is the wireless systems. We're going to start to see the four, the, the, the four players. So right now with Vive and the Vive wireless controller, you can do three players, but I talked to the guys at Intel and they have sufficient channels to do up to six. And the and rumor is they're going to be releasing a fourth channel pretty quickly, which means those trust-based systems where the headset is tethered, my guess is you're going to see those go wireless in the next year. And I think that's an exciting thing um, that's happening. And um, so anyway, those are some of the standards that we're seeing um, that we're seeing uh, happen. So anyway, um, I reviewed, while I was at the show, 25 different VR attractions at IAPA this year. Um, what are the warehouse guild devs think about Oculus Quest? Yeah, I talked to the guys from Oculus. Um, it's a really good question. I talked to the guys at Oculus at the show, you know, and they claim that you know there's no drift. The problem with the, the Quest and Vive Focus is it's inside out tracking, and the inside out tracking tends to have drift. And I did a Windows Mixed Reality um, one in Sydney a few months ago called Samosity, and by the end of the 25 minute game, I was 10 feet away from where I should have been based on what I was seeing, which is really dangerous. And so they have to find a way to make sure that there's no drift. Um, and they'll either figure that out or a company like Holodeck that has a hybrid RF that they layer on top of um, that they layer on top of an optical system now, they could easily layer it on top of an inside out tracking system. In fact, one of their engineers just wrote a, his master's thesis on in, hybrid inside out RF tracking. And so I think we'll see all of that stuff. Um, Michael, happy, uh, happy child birthing daddy thing. So Mike Zidane just had a beautiful baby girl, I think. It's hard to tell when they're babies, um, but really cute. So, um, Anyway, so I, I did a ton of VR, and I'm just going to run through it really quickly. So, um, so the first thing that I – and by the way, these are in no particular order. <laughs> um, I barely had time to get the slides together. I certainly didn't have time to rank them. So, um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is VR Studios. And the reason I put – I did put them first for a reason. So I guess they are in some particular order in this case. is because I have – 
um, underestimated these guys for a long time. I met with some of the founders of the company several years ago, maybe three years ago, and just you know, watched them really try to find their way through. First, they were going to do big free roam, and they couldn't get that. To, first, it was going to be all wireless free roam. Then it was going to be small free roam. Then it was going to be big free roam. And then they came out with these other Atom and all these other things. And I'm just like, it felt like they were just throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what would stick. And um, and I will say that at IAPA this year, they really seemed to come into their own. They had a couple of products there that were really impressive to me. Um, if one of them was pretty pricey. So uh, we're going to talk about this one first. So this was their four-player esports game called Power Play. And um, it's a um, – okay, guys, stop talking about Mike's kid and stop pay, pay attention to my damn webinar. Sorry, just kidding. Um, so what they've done is they've created a four-player, 30 by 30, 1,000-square-foot space. Um, and it's 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 basically two on two laser tag if you can imagine that and you have a vive controller and you're shooting there's a couple of things i like about it one is um there's a lot of strategy there's a lot going on so in order to recharge your power level so you have ammo basically you have to walk over these yellow dots so it's kind of like pac-man so you can't just hide in a corner and snipe people you actually have to move and expose yourself in order to get ammo to be able to shoot and so the combination of knowing that you have to move to rearm yourself and then the stealth nature of the game added a level of strategy to the game that i thought found really really compelling by the way as a um as a longtime laser tag player, right? I've done a lot of fucking laser tag. And so um, so I thought that that was really interesting. And then the way they did the barrier, so the, you can see the purple barriers here on the screen. Those walls you can't go through, but the yellow parts, you could actually stick your head or your gun through and shoot. You can't shoot through them, but you can stick yourself through and shoot them. And so you really have to be mindful about where you are. And then if you get shot, you have to respawn spawn in the corner and show up. So it was super fun. Um, they did a great job of celebration at the end. You get a confetti cannon, which is something that I think the minority media guys do at Chaos Jump also. Um, and so I really liked it. The thing I didn't like about it was they mapped the virtual space to the physical space one Four people running around a small room. It's a thousand square feet, um, and there wasn't a lot of variety. And so, for a ten-minute game or a five-minute game or whatever it was, it was fine. But my 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 bet is that people are going to tire of it too quickly. Um, now, anytime you're playing against other people, you get great variety in gameplay because everybody plays differently, and so you have innate repeatability in any kind of a competitive game like that. Um, but I was just felt like they could do more with the footprint. I'm going to talk about a company that's doing an amazing job of that here in a second. The other thing I wasn't crazy about was their price. So they were quoting a hundred grand and a 15% revenue share, which for the gameplay that I played, I thought was a bit on the absurd side. Um, yeah, Chuck, I will send all of those out um, and send out a replay on those slides also. Um, and uh, and so I think um, I, I was just a little concerned about price, but you know what? The market will dictate where it should be. And if it earns, the price is irrelevant, right? So we'll have to see as it gets installed and what the, what numbers come uh, come back out of the market. The other thing these guys were showing is, um, is their Atom system, which um, they have basically a room scale and the um, kind of like a, a Vive wireless room scale system. And these cubes were built by Exit Reality. I'm sorry about the photos, by the way. I didn't go through getting photos thinking I was going to do a webinar. I captured a lot of video, and I had to do screen grabs off of the video. So the photos are kind of shit. I apologize for that. Um, and... Um, and the and so, but what the, what I liked about the Atom system is they had a two player using Vive Wireless, which was cool. Um, so you're untethered, and you got two people in there. And they I played their zombie game, and it was really super fun. Like there was real peril in it. They would sneak up behind you. You had to cover 360 degrees. Um, and um, and I, at least for the single, I played the one if two people, it might have been too easy. But for a single player, um, I found it really fun. And they had four levels for each game, and you could. And I was I didn't quite understand how you progress through the levels. You pay and you play a game, and if you beat level one, the next time you come, you play level one. But then if you'd beaten it, you get level two for free. They said or something like that. I didn't quite understand the progression system. But um, anyway, this was a thirty-five thousand dollars. So the 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 Adam system is twenty-five grand per. 
unit and then the exit reality cube cubes another 10 so it's about 35 grand for two players so 17.5 per player and as we get into some of the pricing you'll see that that's actually a really reasonable price um, for a quality VR experience so I was exp I was really impressed with these guys as you guys know they did the um, the integration. They were one of the companies that participated in the Dave and Buster's Jurassic World rollout. I literally have talked to like 10 companies that say they played a role in that. Hard to say who did what. Um, but I know that these guys were kind of at the center of it. Um, so the other thing, the other one that I really liked, and I've done just fair disclosure, I've done some strategy work with these guys. They're out of Germany, a company called Holodeck VR. And they were spun out of a company, uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, which I think invented like MP3 and a whole bunch of core technologies and they license those technologies and they have this it, this patented technology around RF hybrid tracking. And RF tracking is interesting because it's really not accurate enough to use by itself for free roam VR. It's what we would say centimeter accurate. And like HTC Vive Lighthouse is like millimeter, sub-millimeter accurate, really super accurate. And you need millimeter accuracy if you're going to do free roam VR, so, but, but it's really efficient because there's no occlusion. So you could put 100 people in a 10 by 10 room and track everybody with RF, theoretically. Um, and so what these guys have done is they've taken, y, um, they've taken RF and they've layered it over optical and they've created with mobile VR a really, really interesting and very unique product. And this is what I love about it. I'm all about differentiation in the VR space. And there's too little differentiation. And so I'm going to show you, and I have to show you a video um, for this. So I apologize. I'm hoping it works, but check out this video that I took. I knew it So this is in a pop-up at Point Orlando, and they've been there for just for the week. And these are a bunch of kids. It's a mobile headset. The game's really the game they're playing is called Fruit Splash, and the kids are just running around having a ball. There's no cords. There's no cables. There's no guns. There's no nothing. And um, yeah, they're safety third. Absolutely. Look. If you've ever been on a bouncy uh, to a bounce house or a trampoline park, you understand that this is not actually dangerous at all. Um, but I just loved how these kids were in VR, and they were freaking having a blast. Um, and so, anyway, you can kind of see. And I think this is where you can actually see the game of what they're like doing. There's bugs that run around that you shoot. There's power-ups and a blender. So it's basically the game itself. I don't know if I got a very good shot of that. I didn't, but... Um, so you get the idea. And so, um, now i got to figure out how to go back to the slides. Hold on. I didn't think that a, um, I didn't think that a, a, a static shot was going to get my point across there. And so what they've done is they've created what I call if, if, if zero latency and polygon and some of these other high-end free roam systems are like Call of Duty, this is Candy Crush. It's casual mobile gaming for kids and families. You literally put on the headset and you're playing. There's no instructions. There's no queuing area. There's no staging area. It's ridiculous. And they can put 10 people in 1,000 square feet or 20 people in 2,000 square feet. So the cost per player is really, really low. It's high throughput, high player density, um, and therefore should be our so um, they were not using the mobile um, camera for positioning. They're using a combination of optical and RF. And so they have some optical cameras um, up around. But like in that space, you could use 10 optical cameras where if you were running a, when I did the Polygon demo, which I'll talk about next, um, here in a second, they had like 40 optical cameras. And it gets really, really, um, really, really expensive. So, um, but it is OptiTrack-like. Opti tracking. Yes, Emmanuel. Um, they use a company called Qualysis, but there's a bunch of companies in that space. Um, so the other one I want to talk about, um, Gail, it's um, it's between 100 and 150,000 for 10 to 20 players, depending on how much space you need. Um, and Gail, you can message me offline if you want more details on it. Um, and how's the weather in Alaska? Uh, so Minority Media, Chaos Jump, it is one of those games that I'll say is inspired by Hollowgate. The thing that they've done really well is they've shrunk down the footprint, 12 foot by 12 foot, so 144 square feet versus Hollowgate and Play VR from Exit Reality. Exit Reality is 17 by 17, which is 289 square feet. So it's literally half the size. Um, and so if square footage is a concern, 
um, this on a revenue per square foot basis is going to do double what those other systems are. Uh, the game's super fun. They did a couple of other things. I tried to grab a screenshot here to show you. Um, so I don't know if you can see it, but you see this guy here, this clown. He, so first of all, you can see that all of these guys are wearing goofy heads. They're these like avatar heads, which people freaking love. Um, and what it's done is really, it's really clever because it gives you, um, it creates that social thing. In the beginning, you see your friends and you see them put on the goofy head. So you know that you know, I would know that Gail's the the clown and Emmanuel's the panda, and I'd be the dinosaur, and somebody else would be the, you know, the 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 the, 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 the Trojan or whatever. And so during the game, we can actually see who's who really easily. Um, but then they, they've created from a game standpoint, they've done a great job. Like this guy won the round, he gets a crown. And so there's five rounds. At the end of each round, there's a winner of that round, and that guy wears the crown for the next round. So lots of chances to win. And then at the end of the game, there's one winner of the whole thing based on points, but that they have they have different leaderboards. They have a leaderboard for the most gold collected, because in between rounds you have this gold vacuuming. Um, game where you have to suck up all the gold. So lots of games within the game, which creates great gameplay and massive repeat play. I watched a I watched a kid play this game nine times in a row over a two day period. So um, and I understand that Family Entertainment Group is testing this um, at one of the, at um, Camelback Lodge, and it's doing um, it's doing ridiculously well. And so. Um, so the other one that I was – this is one of my favorite experiences um, at the show. Actually, it wasn't at the show. It was at a motion capture studio at Orange County Technical College, I think, which was about 10 or 15 minutes away from the um, – it was about 10 or 15 minutes away. Yeah, Michael also pointed out on Chaos Jump, they have 18 different worlds that you go to, but you only get to do two or three in each version, and so there's a randomizer. So you never get the same. I've played it all. I've never played the same game twice, and I've played it seven or eight times. Um, and so this is from, a, from Neurogaming. Um, they had two products at the show. This one is their high-end product called Polygon, and it's a free roam, six-player, 1,000-square-foot PvP esports game. Um, these are actual screen grabs from inside the game. The art style is fucking amazing. Um, but what I love about what these guys have done, as opposed to VR Studios in their player versus player thing, is they've done an amazing use of space. It was actually because it was inspired by Superhot. Um, they've done an amazing use of space. So instead of, it's a thousand square foot physical space. Um, and I see where you are in the physical space as a ghost, so I don't bump into you. But your avatar, might be a hundred yards away. So they've created a five level arena, five levels high, that feels like 5,000 square feet. And they have elevators and platforms that you ride so the, to move you around. So the feeling of space is immense. They've done an amazing job of space utilization. And what that does is creates a lot of game variety and the ability to do, um, and the ability to do, um, leagues and tournaments. The other thing that they've done, they've got a tournament system built in, but they've integrated what's called OBS, which I don't know if it, if it actually stands for this, but it's online broadcast suite. So they have 30 virtual cameras that follow the action around. And those ca the camera feed gets sent out to YouTube and Twitch. So each player can register their private Twitch or YouTube channel and have their game video live streamed to their fans online. Fucking amazing. So for each VR and e, uh, open broadcast software, thank you, Brad. If you're interested in VR and esports, um, this is the thing. And it's the, it's, it was probably one of my favorite things at the show. Um, it's high end. It's not cheap. It's like a quarter of a million bucks for a six-player system and 250,000 square feet. Um, the other thing they do is live live site-to-site -site competition. So the six people in our location – play live against six people at another location. And right now they have two other locations, one in Moscow and one in Amsterdam. But as they roll these out, there'll be live site-to-site -site competition. So it is um, better than Omni. Doug, it is way better than Omni. But again, different price point, um, very different experience. Like they're using the striker guns. Um, yeah, there's no comparison. This to me was, as an old laser tag player, this to me has been probably my favorite VR experience to date. Um, the other, um, yes, and it is Brad. It is it is um, uh, opt, uh, it is opt to track for now. Um, this is another product that Neurogaming brought to market. And sorry, the logo. That's the Exit Reality logo there. That's all squished. Um, and it's called Play VR. And um, 
And, um, and it's basically neurogaming software platform for four player tethered VR in Exit Reality's X-Arc. Um, the X-Arc, uh, you can kind of see it here. They wanted to build something that was beautiful and stunning and not based on trust, which they did. It's like polished aluminum. It's got video screens all around it. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the Play VR games are amazing. Um, uh, Revolver, they just released a new version of Revolver, which was probably my favorite four-player tethered game, and they somehow made it better by adding multiple levels. Um, they've got World of Tanks VR. They've got about 13 or 14 games. All are really polished. Um, and so these guys had, and so Neurogaming had two products, and then Exit Reality, we'll talk about some more of their stuff. They had a huge show. Um, so this is their X-Pod, I think, or X-Hub, X-Hub. Um, and so the X-Hub is a two, this is from Exit Reality, is a two-player, um, tethered VR booth, HTC Vive room scale. Um, and what they did at the show is they put, um, they put, um, sorry, uh, mixed reality streaming in it. And so you could go in there and actually watch the mixed reality stream from the booth and you could see people playing. They used, obviously they were using Beat Saber because Beat Saber's um, got you know amazing following and it's got great visuals. And so um, there are two companies that are doing this. One is a company that I've talked a lot about mixed, um, called um, Blueprint Reality and they have a product called Mixcast which allows you to stream and then record those um, those videos and then share them on social. And then um, this particular integration, because Beat Saber's done this integration, was with a company called Live, L-I-V. Um, and they released a similar product to Mixcast where at least on the low end, you could literally download um, the streams and it creates an extra revenue. Both platforms create additional revenue shares for operators. And so the whole mixed reality thing is gonna be huge. Every platform is going to have it at some point. I would say that by IAPA next year, if you're bringing a VR product to market without some sort of mixed reality spectation and social sharing, you're probably missing the boat. Um, so speaking of Beat Saber, another company that really surprised me there was VRsenal. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say surprised me. They were at IAPA in 2015 when I first saw Zero Latency, which kind of got me on the back on the VR bandwagon. And... Um, and what they did is they um, they came out with a product called Hollow Cube in 2015. Didn't work very well, and so then they disappeared. They went quiet. Well, apparently they didn't go out of business. They went back to the drawing board, and they um, and they started working on unattended VR. And since then, they've done the software integration for a company called Periscape, which is running these beautiful VR towers at Kennedy Airport's Terminal 4, doing really, really well. Um, and they also have done the VR lounges at Punchbowl Social, um, which have been, according to the people at Punchbowl, very, very successful. And so, um, and so they brought to IAPA a large freestanding, unattended, VR platform, and they had three games. They had uh, Beat Saber, they had um, uh, Fruit Ninja, and they had Predator. And um, there were a couple of things they did really, really well, and a couple of things they did not so well. So I'm going to talk about the things first that I really liked. So one is, you know, and you know we're all using consumer VR. You get consumer VR in a VR arcade where the owner, you know, it tends to be an entrepreneur owner there. You're watching the... Um, you're watching the, the equipment really carefully and how people handle it. And even then you have, um, you have challenges. But if you're going to start doing unattended VR and family entertainment centers, you need to ruggedize your shit. Um, Tamor, I'm not sure I understand your question about prices for uh, Beat Saber. If you're talking about the VR signal unit, it was $35,000. Um, the, the, I think the, the X hub from Exit Reality um, is less than that. Uh, I want to say each of those cubes runs about between 10 and 15. So for a two player version, you're probably with, with mixed reality and, you know, included, you're probably at um, 25 to 30 grand. Um, and so um, what these guys did was for unattended VR, they built a really nice cover over the headset, 3D printed with strain relief. And then they created these coily cords that not only secure the handsets, but power them. So you don't have to charge them really freaking smart. Um, that they're not just trying to create software that allows you to have unattended VR, but also, like, how does the hardware going to play? 
Um, some of the things they didn't do as well that I think need some work is um, this is the on the left you'll see that's the Predator one and it has a gun. They're using the Striker gun, and the Predator was forty grand. Um, and um, and 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 you can see they kind of got them jumbled together. And I'm not crazy about the way they're going to have to figure out a better way to. Ha I think just hanging those things and having them mounted together and bump bumping into each other isn't going to actually work. Um, and then this guy in the middle, you could see because they made this look like a giant arcade game with a big screen in front of it, he thought he could just grab the gun and start shooting at the screen. And so I told him, I was like, dude, you got to put the headset on. And he's like, oh, am I allowed? And I said, yeah, that's how it works. Well, then he put the headset on and it didn't work. And so now, granted, these were probably prototypes. I've done a million shows. I always cut people slack when they bring stuff to trade shows. Um, the gun is, I think, it's, I think it's an extra five grand for the Predator, by the way, over the other two. Three of that is the Striker gun. The Striker gun's three grand off the shelf. And then the cabinet is aged and hand varnished. Like, it's beautiful. It's a work of art. Um, so that's the, that's the extra five grand. Um, and so I think that there are some there, there are some issues around free you know a, around VR as an unattended product. You got to get it right, and giving them two controllers to to use actually might just ramp up the complexity where people can't get their heads around it. The other thing I did grab is a screenshot of Windows, um, which means they haven't really run an embedded operating system here and hardened the OS. And I really have concerns about people bringing PC based products into the arcade system without really understanding how to run an embedded. OS, a red, or an embedded op, a version of OS. Um, and now, again, it's a prototype, I'm sure, and I'm sure it'll get better over, um, um, over, I don't, Fahad, I don't think there's a license fee for, um, for, um, for the VR Arsenal product. I think that's part of the reason they priced it so high. Um, so anyway, so that's VR Arsenal. Um, the next one I want to talk about, well, one of the buzzes of the show was, um, um, yeah, I hope I, you know, I talked to him about the build and I asked him if I could take pictures and Ben said, look, it's, it's, it's a prototype. It's not production quality. So I actually didn't take pictures because of that. Um, and so my guess is we need to see the final product. Hopefully we'll see it at amusement expo in March. Um, so the other one is Nomadic. Nomadic had their final, their launch party. They opened their first permanent location. Nothing's permanent, so I put that in quotations marks. Um, none of us are permanent. But, um, and they opened it with Arizona Sunshine. We got to demo it. Um, and I, will, I didn't do the review on it yet, so you guys are going to hear it first here. I forgot to post the video review. Um, so I love Doug Griffin. I love the company. I love the people. I love everything about them. They're 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 smart, humble, intelligent, beautiful people, and I want them to be successful. Um, I will say that I was surprised by their choice of Arizona Sunshine as their first IP, um, only because it's so out there. It's out there everywhere, and 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 it could go two ways. It could give them name recognition, and people say, "Oh, I love Arizona Sunshine. I want to go play it," um, or it could be people saying, "Oh, I played Arizona Sunshine at a VR arcade. Why would I want to go here and play it?" And I don't know how it's going to play out. I will tell you that Attic does it's a, it's a void like experience. All right, so you get lots of um, lots of haptics, lots of environmental effects. The environment is mapped ridiculously accurately to the space. There's switches to throw. There's 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 doors to open. There's things to sit on. Um, and so the environmental um, effects were the best I've done. Period. Hands down. Better than the void. Better than spaces. Uh, Terminator. Um, they were just fucking awesome. The, this screenshot that I sent you is from in-game video where you're on a helicopter, which is on a motion base. Um, and it's amazing. In the beginning, you start out on a train and the floor is vibrating and the wind is blowing. And you stick your head out of the train car and you feel the wind in your hair. It's fucking amazing. Um, and so I loved it. And I think for the people who, for the average VR person, they're going to love it too. Like the, the feedback from most people was that was amazing. But, you know, I'm not the average VR person, and I tend to be a little more critical than everybody else. And the reason for that is because I want it to be perfect. I want everybody to be successful. And in order to do that, I'm offering this. All of this criticism comes from a place of love. I hope everybody understands that. Um, and the game the, the, the game just wasn't there for me. And, and I talked to the guys from Vertigo Games, and I think that they know that. And they're going to continue to work on it and perfect it. But I thought that the, um, I thought that the, the game was weak. 
like shooting zombies in a distance. Um, you know, they didn't feel like there was any skill. Like if I just pointed my gun in the average direction, they, they, you know, their heads popped off. Um, I thought mo for the most part, the zombies couldn't get to us. So there was no sense of peril. Again, similar to the alien descent game from pure imagination and Fox next where the aliens are up against the cage in an elevator and I'm just shooting at them and they can't get to me as opposed to the VR studio zombie game where they were like right up on my face. It's like, ah, fuck, I want to be scared. If I'm doing a zombie experience, I want to be scared. Like, that's why we do zombie experiences. We don't do it because they're fun. We do it because we wanted to have the shit scared out of us. Um, and it just wasn't scary at all, really. Um, there was one moment with, where there's a dead body that you have to interact with, which was awesome. Um, but as far as the gameplay itself, it needed work. And I'm sure they're going to figure it out. Um, but for right now, I'd say the environment was amazing and the game wasn't quite is amazing. Um, okay, so moving on, Creative Works. So last year, Creative Works launched um, with Hollow, launched Hologate, had an amazing show, and now, and we'll talk about Hologate in a second. Um, Creative Works brought some new product to the to the show. I'm not going to talk about the esports product because this is a VR webinar, but they did bring an esports console um, running GG Circuit. Which is really interesting, and we're going to do an eSport panel at Amusement Expo on March 26th that will talk about um, eSports and FECs, um, both VR and traditional eSports, traditional eSports, listen to me. Um, but what CreativeWorks did bring as a product, and again, more disclosure, I have worked with these guys on strategy, um, a company called Scale One Portal developed a game called Voxel, and it's a, it uses uh, what's called CAVE technology, um, which is a weird recursive acronym. CAVE stands for cave animated virtual environment or something like that. Um, 3D um, depth sensing cameras, similar to my Microsoft Connect, these use Intel cameras, and 3D projectors, projection mapping with short throw video, so it projects onto the walls and the floor. Um, and they have a two-player version and a four-player version, and then you use synchronized 3D glasses. So the things pop out of the floor, and it really is super immersive. Um, and it's uh, fun. They had a couple of games there. They had a, a, few, a running, a maze runner. They had a, a music rhythm game. And then at the show, they announced a new product from Sony and um, Specular Theory um, call from based on Hotel Transylvania 3 uh, called Popstick. It's another music rhythm game. So anyway, really well received and really casual. For people that don't want to put on a headset, uh, this is a great option of a way to have an immersive, fun, lighthearted game without having to deal with all, or operators that don't want to go into the headset yet. Um, you'll get there eventually, but for now, this is a good option. Um, Hologate continues to crush it. Um, they were awarded the best um, best uh, new game. I don't know. There's so many award categories that I app, I can't keep them straight, but they won a brass award, award for their game Zomboid, which released earlier this year. Um, I've been a little critical of that. I didn't think the I, like the game, it, I think it's their best game. Um, though the new beat uh, Groove Guardians looks really cool too. Um, I went online. I said I just you know I think there's so much new product there that I was a little disappointed, frankly, that um, that this went to Hologate. However, Hologate didn't win last year, and they probably should have. So this could be a bit of a make good because last year Zero Latency won with new games that were just games, and they had been there the year before. So maybe this is all just a year a, a year in arrears. But the bottom line is these guys are crushing it, um, and they also announced the game. Uh, Angry Birds 2 game, which will come out in July in association with Sony Pictures and the new um, Angry Birds movie coming out. And so, oh, somebody's calling me. Who is that? Suspected spam. I love that. Should I answer? Um, all right. So, ah, so this product, um, so I've been pretty critical of Omni treadmills for years now. Um, and um, and those, these guys, Jan um, Gutelak and his team at Virtuix have really, really come a long way. And they created what I think was the best looking product at the show. Um, the Omniverse Arena was fucking gorgeous. Um, it's a turnkey. Um, Normand, I think Hologate's pretty, pretty reliable. Like there's 150 of them out there and I'm not hearing any, um, any complaints. So um, it is... Um, so they had, and so Doug mentioned that they had some problems again. I, I cut people wide swath when they have problems at um, trade shows. The Wi-Fi interference is massive. All of these systems depend on Wi-Fi in some way, shape, or form. Um, last year, you know, uh, two years, three years ago, 
uh, zero latency had to go to a one player demo because they couldn't get their guns to run and um, to communicate. Last year, VR Studios had a 2,000 square foot arena on the show floor and maybe ran demos for four hours out of the whole four day show. Um, and this year they were smart enough to bring a network engineer. Um, so don't, don't take, take all the operational problems you see with products on the show floor with a grain of salt. Um, so what these guys did I thought was really interesting. First of all, what they've done is try to address some of the labor issues. So um, they've gotten rid of the diaper that you had to put in first and strap in. So now you just step into it. And you can literally clip yourself into the Omni. Um, you don't actually need assistance. Though they did have attendants in there helping people to help with throughput. Um, the other thing that they did was they created these staging areas inside the room, the, 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 the attraction. So there's two staging areas for four people each. Um, the staging areas have these little clip-on overshoes, so you don't have to put on shoes now. You just take these little, they're like flip-flops, and they go over your shoes. Um, and that's what provides that slippery sur surface. Um, the other thing that they've done is they've created these, um, and so you have one group on the left that's staging, and the other group, and they have little, um, they have little cubbies where you can store your stuff, right? And so the left group is staging while the, the group on the right is playing, then the group on the right comes back and goes on the right side, and the left group goes in. So they've built the staging areas into the attraction to increase throughput, really smart. Then the other thing that they've done is they've created these little tablets, and I don't have pictures of them, I thought I did, but I didn't stick them in here, but they've created tablets, actually you can see them right here, there's on the left left picture, there's a couple of tablets. It's a shitty screen grab. Um, and on the tablets, ha they have mini games they're creating. And the mini games are a curated social experience before the, the, the main attraction starts. So you go in there with four people. You may or may not know them. You play a mini game to determine who the team leader is. The team leader gets to pick which games out of the Omni library of 10 or whatever game. You create a social experience and a game before you get in. By the way, that whole process takes five minutes or seven minutes, right? Which is actually the experience that people are paying for. Then you go into the Omni, you pay seven minutes on the treadmill, and then you come out and you do social sharing on those kiosks as well where you can download and stream videos of your game. And so they've created a 20-minute so, um, curated experience with only seven minutes in VR, which means you can charge more. And you don't have to get into this per minute bullshit that I hate, which drives your margins down and, and really affects your, um, your return on investment. So anyway, I think this is a really brilliant product. Um, it's got its limitations. You know, this, the treadmill thing isn't really running. I will say that it's almost like running and having two guns and running around shooting zombies in the head is a lot of fucking fun. Um, and just you got to be careful how long you go for it. Because you can't go but in seven minutes, it's totally safe. Um, so another company I've done some um, some strategy consulting with is a company called Radon. They're a military contractor. They had a product called um, they released called Total Recoil. It is a turret based wave shooter. Think Global VR's Beachhead Two Thousand combined with um, combined with um, um, Sorry, I got distracted. Don't read the comments, Bob. Um, I got distracted by the comments. Um, combined with uh, Starship Troopers. So basically giant space bugs coming at you wave after wave. You're shooting it. The gun itself is, is a version of their 50 caliber, caliber military simulator. Um, it's really fucking fun to shoot. It's going to earn like crazy. Um, and uh, it was one of my favorite products at the show. I'm really stoked about it. Hope, no, I think the treadmill issue is fine. I think that just some people have been critical about it over time. Um, it, it's a, it's a, I, I've been critical of it. And when I actually played it, um, and I played it in a social environment in that structure, I loved it. Um, I just played for too long. I played for 25 minutes because I was having so much fun. I should have quit at 10 minutes. Um, so Virtual Rabbids. So this is the first unattended VR arcade product. They had released it at IAPA last year. Um, and it is doing really well. I've talked to a bunch of operators that are running it. They're astounded at how much money it's making. And I just, I took a video. Look at this kid. Look at his face on the right. He's there with his dad. And I think the reason this thing is earning so well is it's so accessible. Like little kids, adults. I've seen 60-year-old women in this thing. Um, everybody loves it. Um, it does make me shit. Uh, sick, by the way, because I'm really sensitive to motion sickness. Um, but that isn't stopping it from earning a lot of money. It's unattended. It's a great. The other thing I was like, look at it. It's beautiful. 
And this is the thing that the VR companies need to really learn. LEI has been making arcade games forever, and they know how to make something that looks beautiful and has what we call curb appeal. Um, and so we need to get some of the VR guys building stuff that looks like this. And, and I think, Jan, you did a great job with the Virtuix Omni Arena. Um, another one that I did, which I thought was really interesting, and it's not there yet, it, they couldn't get it working. And this is what I love about trade shows and hate about trade shows, is the dates don't move. And when you're marching to a big trade show and you're trying to, um, and you're trying to release um, a product, sometimes you don't get it done in time. So this is from a company called Major Mega in Colorado, no, Pennsylvania. Um, and it's a product called HyperDeck. And it was a, it's a four-player um, very high-end experience. So this is going to sell for a quarter of a million bucks. Um, and you can see on the right here, this is Dominic from NVIDIA, who's their head of VR, um, was playing it. And the floor is a D-Box simulator with six inches of travel. Those, those holes there are fans that can pump up to 40 mile an hour winds and heat. And so this is like the void on steroids. Um, and it, they, the game that they had there was kind of a turret-based shooter um, it was really well themed. The game was about this like rock god that's taken over the world. So it was kind of like a little bit of um, Jack Black and Tenacious D's Pick of Destiny meets um, meets um, uh, who is it? Turn it up to eleven. Um, you know those guys with the salami in his pants. Somebody help me out in a comment. Spinal Tap. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, so they um so anyway um the game was it, it didn't work like like it just didn't work it's not there yet they've got work to do but it has massive potential and so keep an eye on this i'm hoping to get them at amusement expo at the end of march by then i'm sure they'll have worked out all the bugs um but it was great and it was one of those things where motion actually made the experience better um one of the rare vr motion experiences for me that i really enjoyed <laughs> Um, so the other thing that I got to do right at the end of the show was a product uh, from a company called Backlight, um, and they had a, a VR escape room called um, called Eclipse, and um, it was um, it was this one and another one called the VR Cave that I did. They were both space station experiences. And what I love about VR escape rooms is the research overwhelmingly shows that what people want in VR is social experiences. And escape rooms are innately social. And so creating these VR, these VR escape rooms gives people really what they want. The other thing that they are is they're longer. Um, the longer you're in VR, the deeper the immersion. And so you know these 10-minute VR experiences don't really allow much time for the fantasy reality line to blur. But when you're in a VR experience for a half hour, 45 minutes, it goes really deep. And that really enhances the value of VR. And so I think that having, so this was a really cinematic story driven experience. Unfortunately, I only got to play half the game because it's a four player experience and they only had two players because cost of trade shows. Um, one of the unique things that these guys have done is they've put a haptic floor in, which really deepens the immersion because you're on these elevators and, um, and platforms and you feel it vibrate, similar to what we play VR does with their platform. Um, and it really does deepen the immersion. And they're, pr they're pricing this at 80,000 for four players in two like 16 by 10 foot spaces, which is really reasonably priced, probably underpriced a bit. Um, and so really enjoyed it. Can't wait to do the whole thing. Um, but the VR escape room thing, yeah, and people are familiar with escape rooms. And you saw in the beginning, I don't know if you caught it, but the Google Trends show escape rooms are still popular and even more popular as far as trends go than um, than even VR is. Um, another product that was on at Point Orlando was a company called from a company called Y Dreams Global. Now I've been a fan of these guys from Brazil. They recently moved to um, their headquarters to Vancouver, but they do amazing large immersive media implementations at like the Olympics and shit like that. And um, so they created a four player. Uh, room scale wireless shooting experience. This again using the Vive wireless. I, um, it might have been three players, um, but it will be four player once Vive gets that that um, fourth channel open. And um, I did try the VR cave, Rob. I'll talk I'll, and I'll I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I want to actually I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that. I don't know if I have a slide here for it. One of the things I really liked about Backlight was. So they're using Vive controllers. Both VR Cave and Backlight are using Vive controllers, and um, and 
and it's not the most dexterous thing, right? A Vive controller with virtual hands. What Backlight did that was really good is when I they gave me pressure sensitive fit trigger. So if I move the triggers in slowly, my hands did this slowly. So I had a little bit of dexterity. The other thing is when I went to grab something, if I went to grab a a, a, a canister, the canister would bolt into my hand. Or if I went to push a button, the virtual finger would go like that, so I know I was supposed to push a button. So they were really smart about the avatar hand and how it engaged with the environment. VR Cave didn't do that at all, and it was a little frustrating because part of it is you have to catch these canisters going through, um, going through to the you know like being shot out. You had to put them in places, and and so it, you had to be really dexterous. And they just gave you open close hands, and they didn't magnet the 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 thing to your hand. And so I think there's some room for improvement there. Um, they did add trackers to my feet, but I got to be honest with you, that didn't add anything. And I'm not a fan of foot tracking. I still haven't found a great reason for it yet, to be honest with you. So I think it just adds operational complexity with a lot, without a lot of value. Um, and there are some minor exceptions to that, which I won't go into right now. Um, Anvio is one of them, by the way, where you have to kick these boxes out of the way to clear way from room to room. Um, so Y Dreams has a, had a multiplayer game called Arcave. You're in like in a space station or something. You're down low. The enemy has high ground up multiple levels surrounding you 360 degrees. You have two pistols and you're just blasting the shit out of zombies, robots, whatever they were. Sometimes they would appear right in front of you from doors that would open. Sometimes they would show up up above. Sometimes it would be drones. There'd be power-ups that would give you like a shield you could hide behind. Um, it was a 25-minute game. It felt a little bit, uh, well, actually, it felt like a 25-minute game. It might not have been. It might have been 10 minutes. I, I don't remember. Um, but my arms, the only thing I didn't like about it was because your enemies are up the whole time. And they had the Vive Wireless, which adds a lot of weight to the back of your head and the headset. My neck and arms were sore at the end. Now, granted, I'm not buff and in shape, but I was kind of sore. I like, like about halfway into the game, I was like, fuck, my arms are tired because all the enemies are above me. Um, it's a little nitpicky. Other than that, it was a really good experience. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I think we're getting to the end. I think this was um, – so this was Paradrop, um, company, created by a company called Front Grid in in um in conjunction with SimWorks, and so basically it's a parasailing simulator. Um, that's me on the left in the chair, and you have these controls, and you pull the controls, and you're up on this mountain lakey area, and you're flying through, you're flying through some targets, some ring targets, and you can go down on the water. Um, and it was a really cool experience. I did get a little bit of motion sickness, not bad, on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe a 2 um, from it. I talked to uh, David Wells. Uh, uh, I think it's David Wells. Or he might be a picture formerly from the New York Yankees. Um, and he said that um, – he said that um, that I was on easy, and the more advanced ones have more motion, and the more motion is mapped more to one to one, and that might have been better for me. So, but um, they've recently announced they're going to install this at the Bear Gorillas Adventure Park in England. Um, it's uh, it's a bit pricey, but it's it's less than Birdly, um, which is like two hundred grand or something like that, and. Um, and the you know and, and or it's it's six figures whatever and this is a this is low six figures but um, really cool experience and if you have a really high traffic facility where you could get you know I think you can easily get five to ten ten bucks for this in a three minute experience two to three minute experience um, it was really interesting so um, Joanna I did not I talked to the people at Hollow Zone the show was ending I ran out of time. Um, and I do hope to do it in LA. The other one I want to try in LA is Virtual Room. Um, and um, I heard mixed things about the Hollow Zone because I think they were at EAS. Um, and I've heard mixed things about it, but I do want to try it myself. Um, and so that takes us to almost an hour, um, all in three minutes. So I want to do a couple of things I want to um, invite you guys to do. Um, one is. Um, Let's see, where is my um, – hmm, I can't find it. Oh, well. So I do have a mentoring group um, that's online on Facebook, and I'll send out a link to that in the replay that goes out for the website. Um, and I will also um, – 
send out a link to my new YouTube channel where I'll put all the videos that I've done onto YouTube so you guys can search by keyword and shit and find them rather than have to watch all my rambling via uh, videos on Facebook all the time because I know that that can be super annoying. Um, and, um, and my post IAPA wrap up, stay tuned for more online. Um, I'll continue to write about this. And um, if you guys have questions, just send me an email at vrbob at bobcooney.com. And um, I look forward to seeing you. Oh, and Amusement Expo, March 26th in Las Vegas, full day education summit on VR, location based VR. Um, um, and um, um, we will have then two days of exhibit space on the 27th and 28th. There's going to be a lot of VR there. I expect it to be amazing. Um, you know, Doug, if I had to pick a favorite, I'm going to say it was Polygon. Um, from neurogaming um you know for me that was just a transcendent a transcendent experience um there was a lot of good stuff though that was the takeaway for me and a lot of operators were basically saying like last year they went and the only thing really to buy was hollow gate so everybody bought hollow gate and this year everybody went and went ah oh, shit there's so much good stuff what do i buy and uh so there was a little bit of paralysis i sensed in the operator community and so hopefully this helps a little bit i don't think you can go wrong and i think you can i think all of these products that i reviewed were good and and i don't think you can go wrong with any of them and i think that um and i think you should buy more than one i mean that's really the thing is that vr is getting to a point now where it's real and it turned the corner this year at iapa so um, as far as commercial success for operators, when you Rob, what do you mean by operators? Do you mean VR arcade operators or FEC operators, theme park operator? What kind of operator? Hmm. For an FEC, yeah. Look, you can't go wrong with the trust-based system. I think if I were to buy one, I'd probably buy um, the Minority Media Chaos Jump, twelve by twelve, great gameplay, family accessible. Um, you know, I I don't think you can go wrong with that. I think either Hollowgate or we play or play VR. I think the problem. Look at this point. The question is, do you want to have the same thing that everybody else has? And that's the only reason not to buy Hollowgate too. Is that, you know, it's it's kind of IBM. Nobody gets fired by IBM, but you know, when everybody has the same thing, it can be a little bit. Um, it can be a little bit undifferentiated. So it depends on your market and who you're competing with. Um, and I think, um, I, look, I think all of these products are worthy of your investigation. And I really think it depends on what kind of facility you're running. So by the way, the next book I'm working on is um, for operators and not only how to select the right VR based on what your goals are and what your customer base is, but how to operate it, how to market it, how to price it, et cetera. And my goal is to have that book at Amusement Expo. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, Armando, I don't agree with that. The games don't, you know, I don't think the games allow for more movement. I've done all the games and, and basically they're all the same, which is you're spinning around and moving up and down. I would say Revolver, of all the tethered games, Revolver is the one that actually requires you to move around a lot from play VR and exit reality. So, um, um, and so I do, um, let's see, let's see. I think Biggles had a question about who would be the best to approach to build new content. Um, who would be the best to approach to build new content? Yeah, Biggles, that depends on the types of content. Go ahead and message me offline and we can talk about that. Um, I do, I will say the guys at Specular Theory are fucking amazing. Um, and they're, they've been doing great work in VR and they've won a lot of awards and they're really efficient. Um, so, uh, let's see, repeatability of escape rooms. Yeah, Tom, that's one of the challenges with escape rooms is they're not inherently repeatable. Um, and so that's why, but it's nice because you just push a button and change the software. And there's a lot of VR escape room software on similar footprints that's, um, that's coming out. And so they're all going to be running Vive. They're all running the same backpacks or wireless. So I think that as these standards start emerging, I think that if you create the space, it's going to be really easy for you to license software from a provider, plug it in and have multiple VR escape room experiences. So, um, um, let's see who else got to run. See, let's see. Um, 
I didn't get to do the, you know, I didn't get to do the creative work self-setting escape room. There was another company that I met with there called Puzza, P-U-Z-Z-A-H, which is in Denver. They have the highest rated escape rooms in Denver, which apparently has the highest concentration of escape rooms in the country per capita. And they have a self-setting, um, self-resetting, totally automated escape room system as well. And so, um, um, uh, yeah, the other thing that happened, by the way, I'm going to throw out, I saw a lot of people using fucking chlorine wipes, Clorox wipes on headsets. Stop it. Use Sonos wipes, S-O-N-O-S. You can get them on Amazon. They're inexpensive. Um, Sonos wipes on people's faces, please. Um, let's see, what else do we got? I'm just going back through the questions. Um... That's kind of Thoughts on what's going to happen with the pricing in the next year? Yeah, I think um, I think Rob it depends on the type of um, the type of product you're talking about. Um, I do think that you're going to see you're already seeing a race to the bottom. Like it's already happening, um, and so I do think that you've got to be mindful of what I didn't. You know what? I didn't do dojo karate. I wanted to, and it was I just never got to it. Um, it felt a little goofy to me. It was really a mixed reality platform, and I don't know that it has repeat playability. And so I didn't take it seriously. Maybe I should have. Um, so as far as a race to zero, you're also seeing prices go up. Did products come in the market? Like the average price for some of these things was 30, 35 grand per player. So my guess is you're going to see like Hollowgate and Minority Media and, and Exit Realities uh, XARC are looking at a value at 97 grand or 95 grand for four players compared to the Arsenal with, you know, at 35 to 40 grand for one player. Or um, so I think that I think that pricing is still in flux and some of that's going to be driven by. You know, and then you've got the the hyper deck with at four players two hundred and fifty thousand. Like, what are you going to be able to charge for that? You'd be able to charge twenty bucks. I don't know. So I I don't think we have um, I don't think we have the answer to that yet. Um, who leads in providing the best customer experience? Um, I think that that's a good question, James. Um, I would say like that was one of the things I was really impressed with Omni and the Virtuix arena is that they really thought about the whole customer experience. I don't think there's enough people that are thinking about the, 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 what I call the three acts of the experience, the, the act one, act two, act three, set up conflict resolution. Um, I think that, um, I think that that's something we need to see more of, frankly. Um, you know, Nomadic didn't do much to set the scene when I did them. I think the void does a good job of being in character when you go to do them. You know, they, when you're doing Star Wars, you know, they're, they call you recruit and you're a rebel and at least the employees are in character, which helps. But um, I don't think enough people are doing enough with pre-show and post-show. Um, so, cool. Well, guys, I'll, um, I'll leave it going. If you guys want to keep um, chatting, I need to run. Uh, I just love these questions. What's the top issue for LBE that needs to be addressed by the HMD, yeah, by the HMD OEMs? That's a whole nother. We'll do a, we're going to do a tech session. Um, I'm hoping to get Ricard Stryber, who's the president of Viveport Arcade, as a keynote speaker at Amusement Expo. So, um, uh, hopefully we'll address some of that at Amusement Expo, but that's a whole nother, um, that's a whole nother webinar. Um, yeah, I think mobile, 10 day fair, set up tear down. I, I will tell you that Holodeck, they set that thing up in three hours. They carried it on the plane as carry on luggage, the whole setup. Um, and they set it up in three hours in a vacant retail space. Um, I also would talk to Radon. Um, those guys run a a whole fleet of trailers with military training simulators for the um, the National Guard and the U.S. Army, and they one of the things they're planning on doing is putting the Total Recoil game in trailers for carnivals and fairs. And so, you could reach out to Stephen and um, kind of get his uh, his thoughts on that. So, um, all right, I'm out, guys. Thanks so much for joining. This was a great um, webinar. Um, talk to Stephen Haynes. And if you need, yeah, he just put his email in um, in the comments here. So, and if anybody needs anything, vrbob at bobcrooney.com, just drop me an email. Um, join my mentoring group, see you online, and I hope you guys have an awesome week. It's Monday. Hit it. <laughs>